All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another PS Platypus video. I know it's been a very, very long time, and I'm so glad to be back teaching you guys about some of these really, really important topics, especially as we turn the corner and approach some of the more difficult things that, uh, you know, even when we were in second year, we had a lot of issues with these sorts of anatomy and physiology topics, mainly, you know, pelvis stuff and head and neck that can get really, really heavy. Um, but don't worry, we're going to try and help you out, make things a little bit easier. And of course, as always, highlight some of the more high yield topics. So hopefully that is um, helpful for you guys. Uh, I hope that your holidays were good. I hope that the exams went okay. And as always, if you do have any questions, concerns, or things that you just like to raise, or even vent, uh, my messenger is always open. I've got my email somewhere that you can contact me through. Um, but without any further uh, kind of delays, let's just go straight into our first physiology topic for the pelvis, which is male reproductive system. Now, I'm assuming that before this, you will have done some uh, reading or you've watched lectures on the female reproductive system. And you might notice that this one is a little bit um, simpler to kind of digest. So there's not as much detail here. And I've tried to focus a little bit more on um, the kind of more important details, if that makes sense. Now, your lecturer for these physiology sessions is absolutely amazing, um, if he's the same as the one that we had um, last year. So the slides should be pretty much very easy to follow. But I've, again, just tried to focus on the most salient bits. So let's get started. Now, before we go into the nitty gritty, um, I'll just say that the way that I've structured these slides is that um, I've kind of broken it down into about 15, uh, 16 questions that if you're able to answer all of these, you should be able to have a really good time with the male um, reproductive physiology, because essentially it just centers around those 15 questions. So the first one is not really a question. It's just, do you know the broad anatomy and functions of the male reproductive system? On the left hand side, I've just got a diagram from the slides that shows you the main organs within the male pelvis. So again, we, we have a whole anatomy lecture that goes over this, but in short, you should just know some of the unique organs in a male pelvis. So we've got, you know, obviously the urinary bladder, we've got the rectum, but you notice things that are not seen in a female pelvis, like the prostate gland, bulbourethral glands, you've got a very long ureter, obviously you've got the testes, the scrotum, the external genitalia, including the penis. In terms of the actual um, functions of the male reproductive system, you've got four main ones. So the first one is to be able to produce your sperm. So that happens in the testes. You need a transport system to take them out into the penis. So the efferent ducts, the epididymis and vas deferens. You need also glands that actually contribute quite a bit to the final um, semen that is produced. In fact, most of the semen is not sperm, right? So that will include seminal vesicles, prostate, bulbourethral glands, and then you've got um, a way to be able to actually transfer that sperm into the female reproductive tract. So that includes the penis. Okay, so that's the main broad stroke overview. Now let's get into details. So firstly, which compound stimulates an erection? So remember that an erection, again, you probably will discuss this more when you do the neurology and uh, neurovasculature of the um, external genitalia. But in short, it's nitrous oxide or nitric oxide that actually leads to this um, erection. Um, during sexual arousal, you have the parasympathetic nerves and those nerves innervate penile arteries. They produce uh, bursts of nitric oxide, which helps to relax the smooth muscles. And then it allows blood to actually enter into the penis, right? Which increases blood flow. The uh, channel is become engorged and then it becomes erect. So very, very simple. Um, you can see a cross section of the, di uh, of the penis on the right hand side. And you can see that you've got the arteries, you've got um, the dorsal vein, which is pretty important when we get to anatomy. Um, and you've got the urethra, which looks like, um, I, I guess like as a whole, it looks like a bit of a smiley face, which, so the urethra is sort of like um, a mouth there. Um, but this whole system uh, sort of relaxes so that blood can get in. And that blood is the reason why the penis gets erect, right? It's not so much the actual uh, muscles that are contributing to that, if that makes sense. Okay, good. The next one is, so what, what are the features of the scrotum that actually help to control temperature? We know that it's very important for the testes to be in a um, not too hot, not too cold environment because that allows for optimal sperm production. Um, sperm are very delicate cells. So there are two main muscles that help to um, control this. One is you've got the datos muscle. It's a smooth muscle, so we don't really control it. And um, contracts in the cold, which helps to wrinkle the scrotal skin. And the more wrinkled it gets, the less heat loss you get. 
because you're reducing the surface area. The cremaster muscle is a skeletal muscle. It also contracts in the cold, but instead of trying to wrinkle skin or anything like that, it actually elevates the testes closer to the body. So the closer it is to the body, the closer it is to your core temperature, and therefore it can keep it at that really nice 34 degrees Celsius where sperm can be produced. Okay, um, so you can have issues with um, the testes where, for example, they're undescended um, and they're too close to the core body temperature, which means that you can actually have suboptimal sperm production and even infertility. So that's why these uh, muscles are super, super important. Okay, and you've got a diagram at the bottom to show where those two muscles lie. What about the blood supply and how can that actually help to keep the testes cool? Well, just a bit of background. We know that the testes... Um, are located within the scrotum, which is the essentially the skin and the fascia, um, which is external to the um, to the male body. And you've also got, so it's surrounded by two tunicas. So you've got the tunica vaginalis and the tunica albu albuginia. I think that's how it's pronounced. It's very difficult. Um, so the vaginalis is the outermost layer and it's derived from the peritoneum. You'll remember back to the embryology. So remember that the testes has to kind of pierce through the abdominal wall. That's where the vaginalis comes from. And then the al albuginia is the fibrous connective tissue that's on the outside, okay? The vascular supply of the testes is, obviously we've got the arteries. Um, they are directly from the abdominal aorta. So you might remember back to abdominal um, anatomy. And the veins are derived from the pampiniform venous plexus. So I haven't got a really good diagram here that shows um, the pampiniform plexus, but it's a very um, interesting sort of arrangement. Essentially what you see is the veins kind of form a network. It's not just like uh, straight veins, right? They form an actual network or webbing almost that surrounds the arteries. So essentially the veins, because they're a kind of cooler environment and less pressurized, they're able to absorb the heat from the arteries, which then keeps the testes sort of cooler. And of course, um, we'll cover this in anatomy, but um, these are not the only things, right, that go in and out of the scrotum and the testis. You've got the spermatic cord that contains more than just vessels. It contains the nerves, it contains lymphatics, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and this diagram on the right sort of shows you how that convection of heat occurs. Okay. What does the testes actually contain though, right? Speaking of the testes. So within the tunica albu albuginia, you actually have it being subdivided into lobules. And that's just basically the tunica having its own fibrous extensions that go inwards and, and subdivide the testes. Uh, in terms of just numbers, there's a lot. So you've got 250 lobules per testis, and each one of them has about one to four seminiferous tubules on average. Seminiferous tubules are super important. They're the things that contain your uh, functional Sertoli cells, which are the place where sperm is produced, which we'll cover in a sec. And then you've also got the interstitial compartments, so between the tubules, and that contains another very important cell type known as Leydig cells, and they produce the testosterone. So you've got another diagram on the right. It's not so much showing the actual um, cells at all, but it's mainly showing the seminiferous tubules, right? So you can sort of see tubules, Right, so I'm, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor. If you can't, this is gonna be really awkward, but you just got your tubules in this sort of purplish color. And then there's a pink layer just above it, which is a tunica albuginia. So right underneath it is where you have those tubules, okay? Now, where in the testes does this um, sp uh, spermatogenesis actually occur? Well, it's in the uh, seminiferous tubules, right? Because we said that that's where you have the Sertoli cells and Sertoli cells produce the sperm. This process begins at puberty and we'll again go over the actual entire process in another video, but it begins at puberty. It continues into adult life, um, results in up to 400 million new sperm per day. And that's 1500 every second, which is crazy, crazy, crazy. Especially if you consider uh, comparing that to the female reproductive system. How many eggs do you produce in your whole lifetime? Not as many as this, right? Um, and each mature sperm takes about 10 weeks or, you know, more accurately, 64 days to produce. So here is uh, a cross section of a seminiferous tubule. And you can see at different levels in the tubule wall itself, you can see that you've got the differentiation of the cells that then eventually lead to your sperm, which kind of collect within this lumen, and then they can kind of pass through the entire transport system. So obviously, now that we've talked about it, it's very important that we understand the steps that go into spermatogenesis. So I know I've listed a, a, a huge number of steps here, but you know it looks like a lot in words, but I guess if you just look at the diagram and you remember the basic order, it makes a huge, it makes a lot of sense. So you start off with your ter uh, type A spermatogonia. So they are the things that are starting in the basal compartment of your seminiferous tubules. You then have them undergoing a mitotic cell division and it becomes a type B spermatogonia. So far, it's very simple. Eventually, one of those uh, type B spermatogonia is going to divide. It then differentiates into a primary spermatocyte. So you can see that I've labeled that on the left-hand side. 
once we get to this stage, it's now time for those cells to then breach the tight junctions that are between each of those cells. So, so Sertoli cells, they have tight junctions that keep them together. So you breach that um, and then it crosses the blood testis barrier. Here, it's very important that we now, instead of going from uh, mitotic cell divisions, because we just don't want uh, more and more of the same cell, we now want to produce sperms. So we're going to have our first meiotic cell division, and that leads to us having two secondary spermatocytes. After that, we undergo another meiotic division, and we now end up with four spermatids. And then eventually those uh, spermatids end up uh, becoming spermatozoa, or you know, more simply sperm. Um, but the process to get from a cell to another cell, which has like a flagella and all sorts of um, interesting components, we have to undergo spermiogenesis. Before we get to that, it's very simple. Just remember type A spermatogonia becomes type B. Then you get a primary spermatocyte, breaches the tight junctions. Then you get a secondary spermatocyte, spermatids, and then spermatozoa. Okay, they all sound very similar, but they are quite different. So speaking of spermiogenesis, what sort of changes happen? So we have a circular cell at the beginning. And here we've got listed sort of like seven different morphological changes that happen to get from that to a sperm that contains a head, a midpiece, and a tail. Um, all of them are quite important, but I guess in terms of examinable content, it, there's not really much that you can be examined on here. But I think it's just really important to... Like if, you, if you've seen this diagram at least once, then you sort of know what the process looks like. Not so much like exactly the fact that mitochondria multiply or you get excess cytoplasm sloughing off. You know, you don't really need to know the details, but you know the process and it takes about 24 days. Okay, good. What about the structure of a sperm? Very, very easy. So you've got the head and that's the place where you've got all the, uh, the DNA, the nucleus, um, and also the enzyme so that it can penetrate into the egg once it gets there. You've got the mid piece and that's super important because that's where you have the mitochondria. So if you zoom in, you can actually physically see quite a few mitochondria lining the mid piece and that helps to power the flagellum or the tail, which is, as the name suggests, it's the locomotor region. So it helps you to propel the cell through the female internal tract again, once it gets there. What about the fact that you may have heard in your lectures that um, this sort of process of spermatogenesis needs to be cyclic. It needs to be repeating and kind of at different stages at different times. And the reason why that's super important is because if everything happened at the same time together, for example, you have a seminiferous tubule and all the cells in that seminiferous tubule are maturing together, what will happen is they'll all mature together at that 64 day mark, they'll all become mature enough to then, um, you know, fully become fully formed sperm. And then you have to wait another 64 days before you get more sperm. Whereas what actually needs to happen is that this needs to be a constant and continuous supply of sperms, right? Because um, you never know when any of the sperms will be able to enter a female genital tract, right? So that's why at every single location with a seminiferous tubule, you will see that those this process that I was talking about going from the basement membrane into the lumen, you will see things happening at very different times. This um, Roman numerals thing is not very important to remember. It's just a concept that everything happens at different times. That is very, very critical to make sure that we're not having uh, any time frame where there's like no sperm being produced at all. Okay, what about the epididymis? So it's not just a random sort of like clump of the collecting tubules, right? It's actually a very important, um, I guess, landmark for the maturation of a sperm. So it has three main functions. One is to firstly monitor and adjust the composition of fluids that are produced within the seminiferous tubules um, so that it's not, uh, you know, I guess it doesn't have too little water, it doesn't have too much water, that kind of thing, um, so that it can flow easily. It also recycles damaged or underutilized sperm. So if you have a sperm that kind of uh, gets to this point, but then it looks like it's actually not suitable enough to then continue forward, this is where it can get recycled very easily by being absorbed into the epithelium. And then you also have um, probably the most important function is to not only store and protect the spermatozoa, but it also facilitates its uh, maturation. So this is essentially the first point that you get a functional sperm maturing. The second point is actually within the um, female um, reproductive tract, but that's for another lecture. Okay, so let's talk about the actual process. So how is sperm transported down through this entire really complicated tract? Well, it's not that complicated. So firstly, you know, uh, so that we know the sperm are produced within the Sertoli cells, the Sertoli cells within the seminiferous tubules. They then go through various tracts, um, which we will cover in a second, and eventually they end up in the epididymis, right? So at this point, they're immature. They're not actually able to move, even though they have the tail. Um, they tend to travel for about 20 days within this epididymis, and that's when they're actually able to gain their ability to swim and become motile. Uh, the 
the uh, process behind how that happens is not very well understood, but it's being researched. So it can be stored in there for several months before it needs to be ejaculated. But if it's not ejaculated, then remember we said that it can just be recycled and then you get more sperm being produced pretty much 24 seven anyways. The sperm can then be ejaculated from the epididymis and then it enters into the ductus deferens or you know, most commonly called vas deferens. And this is a very, very long tube. So it runs all the way from the serotal sac, which is outside the body. It then goes through the inguinal canal and then eventually joins up with the urethra. And again, the actual uh, location in the urethra it joins into, we will discuss um, more during anatomy. The, semin uh, the seminal vesicles also attach to the vas deferens. So both of, so the vas deferens joins into the urethra, seminal vesicles also enters into the urethra. They both form the ejaculatory duct. And the seminal vesicles are important because they release a fluid that makes up about 70% of the volume. Um, the, the exact substances are not important to remember, but it's just important because it enhances the motility and also the ability to fertilize. So obviously without seminal vesicles, even if you were able to produce the sperms, you wouldn't be able to have those um, actually fertilize in the end. So it's really important that you have these extra bits and pieces. You've also got the prostate gland, which plays a, a significant role again in activating these immature sperm cells. It produces things like nitrous, uh, nutritious citrate, also a couple of enzymes, as well as PSA, which um, has some relevance in detection of like prostate cancer and BPH, that kind of thing, but it's not something we're gonna discuss today. Of course, from here, it everything is in the urethra now, so all those combined fluids, they descend through the prostate and into the penis. Um, obviously the function of that is to convey um, not just the semen, but also urinary fluid. So it's a kind of a joint system there. They're kind of sharing the same tract. Um, another gland that not many people um, talk about, but I think it's discussed in your lecture, is the bulbourethral glands. So you can see in, in the pink label there, uh, very, very, very small, right? But they produce a mucus substance, and it's generally before the ejaculation that it's important because it helps to lubricate it, as well as to neutralize any acid um, urine that might be present within the tract because it's shared, right? And if there's acid urine there, it's going to kill all the sperm that go through. So it needs to be clean before you can have the ejaculate. Okay, let's talk about the hormonal um, control because you know the, the, in the um, female reproductive physiology, the hormones play a very, very important role. And in, I guess in that one, it's actually even more important to know what the roles of like LH and FSH are, but that doesn't make it any less important here. Although it's actually easier to remember. So firstly, you've got the hypothalamus. We know it releases GNRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone in pulsatile bursts, which stimulate the release of LH, FSH, same as in um, the female system. The luteinizing hormone, it helps to stimulate the Leydig cells we talked about within the interstitial space. Those produce testosterone. They will then diffuse towards the Sertoli cells and stimulate spermatogenesis. So Leydig cells are those supportive cells. They produce testosterone. FSH actually directly stimulates the Sertoli cells and the Sertoli cells do a bunch of things, right? Obviously they're the ones doing spermatogenesis, but also they produce some extra factors to facilitate the testosterone, which includes things like ABP, so androgen binding protein, that keeps that testosterone um, from being broken down and increases its half-life. The rising testosterone levels though, like you don't want it to go too high, right? So you need a negative feedback system as in all endocrine systems. Uh, it suppresses the LH specifically. The FSH kind of does another interesting thing. So it stimulates the Tolly cells to do everything we discussed before, but it also stimulates it to make inhibin, which then has negative feedback on the pituitary and then slows down the production of FSH. So LH and FSH kind of, um, they have negative feedback just in slightly different ways, okay? Not important to like remember that distinction too much, but I think it's just an interesting thing to note. Also, if you're struggling to remember, LH has an L, so it stimulates the Leydig cells for testosterone. FSH has an A, uh, has an S, so it stimulates the Sertoli cells, right? And Sertoli cells are where spermatogenesis is happening, another S. Uh, what are the effects of testosterone? Uh, not too high yield, but again, it's discussed somewhere in your slides. So spermatogenesis, very important in the Sertoli cells. It also has that negative feedback to reduce the levels of LH we discussed. Um, it also induces the differentiation of male reproductive organs. So that includes the male secondary sex characteristics. And it also opposes the action of estrogen on breast growth. Remember, this is in males and females. So it's not like only males produce testosterone. Both of them do. It also allows protein um, and anabolism, bone growth, and increased sex drive, as well as in some cases, if you have too much, then um, even aggression. 
um, stimulates the secretion of EPO by the kidneys, which is important for the production of red blood cells. And it also may uh, has an anabolic function. So overall has an increase in basal metabolic rate. Uh, it's not just testosterone that does all the work though, because it undergoes um, transformation uh, via enzymes to other activated forms. So the important one here is DHT, so dihydrotestosterone, which you might cover a little bit more in the embryology of the reproductive tract. And lastly, just a little bit on inhibin, because I think um, it was discussed uh, just on like maybe one slide, but I think it's an interesting topic. Um, so you have your GnRH being produced pulsatile fashion, but you also have activin being produced, uh, which promotes the secretion and production of FSH, similar to GnRH, right? Um, but what this does is, so FSH will then go on to prom uh, promote either follicular genesis in the ovaries with females or spermatogenesis in the gonads of anatomical males. The Sertoli cells in the testes or the granulosa cells in the ovary, depending on which um, case we're talking about, both will produce inhibin, which is that inhibitory molecule, so active in and then there's inhibin. And that inhibin then antagonizes the active in signaling, which then suppresses FSH secretion and prevents actions um, to ensure that you don't have this happening too much, right? So you kind of have, like, it's not just a very simple um, black and white system. And I guess this slide is just to show you that you also have other feedback systems that work in concert um, sort of as a safekeeping, but also just because um, life is rarely ever black and white, right? There's always going to be um, competing pathways. So this is not like super high yield, but as long as you know inhibin and activin and kind of generally what they work for, then that's a pretty good um, place to start. Okay. That's pretty much all the questions that I have. What I'd recommend is after today's um, session, just have a look at all these questions again and see if you can um, maybe not word for word answer the questions, but at least have a, a bit of an idea of if you got this in an exam, uh, what sort of concepts should come to your mind first, right? Um, it's a very simple, straightforward topic compared to the female um, physiology, but it's also quite important because you can be asked to compare the difference between a male and a female physiological system. And in that case, it can be quite helpful just to know like FSH does this in this system, but it does this in another system. Awesome. I think that's it for today. Um, if you do have any questions, again, feel free to message me. Best of luck for the coming semester. Try not to get too stressed. I know it can feel like sometimes it's getting even harder, um, and it sort of is. But remember that you've got a lot of support. So if there's anything, just let us know, and we're more than happy to create some extra resources for you. I'll see you in the next video.